professor of law at the Vermont Law School, a position he has held since 2009. He is also the acting director of the Environmental Law Center. Professor Echevarria has written widely on issues of environmental law and natural resources and takings law. His scholarship has appeared in both law reviews and environmental law journals. Before joining the Vermont Law School faculty, Professor Echevarria was executive director of the Georgetown Environmental Law and Policy Institute. Prior to that, he was general counsel of the National Audubon Society and general counsel and conservation director of American Rivers Incorporated. He's a graduate of both Yale Law School and the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. After graduating from law school, he clerked for Judge Gerhard Gessel of the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. So it's an honor to introduce the members of this very distinguished panel, and I look forward to hearing their remarks. Professor Weiss. Thank you, General Mitchell, and um, welcome everybody to Austin. The Dean is surely right that Austin does winter very well, but one of the things that comes with winter in Austin is allergies, if you've been here long enough. So if uh, my throat sounds scratchy, it's because I've been here long enough. Um, uh, so welcome to Austin. Um, I have the privilege of going first on this panel, and uh, as part of that, I decided that it would make sense for me to frame the issue for you all. Um, it's, it's probably not the case that everybody here has taken uh, courses in environmental law, and some of the questions presented to our panel may not have, may not be in context uh, for you in the sort of context of the structure of environmental uh, regulation. So, as I understand it, we are asked to discuss as a group. Um, the sort of general issue, have environmental statutes and regulations gone too far? Um, has environmental law significantly expanded beyond uh, what it was intended to be? Has it expanded the role of federal government in a way that's um, unwise or unlawful? Um, and, uh, in fact, and indeed, has it expanded the role of federal government too far into the realm of private property rights? So there are three ways to think about what we're about here. The first is, are, is the current manifestation of environmental regulation uh, exceeding the scope and intent of the enacting Congress? So that's, that would be, of course, one problem with uh, the extensive reach of environmental law if it's going much beyond what it was intended to do. The second uh, important inquiry is, uh, does current environmental regulatory regime extend too far into state sovereignty? Has the federal government taken too much authority onto itself to regulate in this area? Um, and then finally, of course, even if, even if the first two are questions are answered in the negative, are we in fact in a situation in which the federal government is just reaching too far into private property rights um, in a way that's untenable uh, and or unlawful? And I want to sort of set the stage for each of those questions. And, and I, I, in, you know, uh, related to what Dean Farnsworth said, I'm the voice of debate here. I'm the liberal on the panel. I'm a uh, you know, self-professed environmentalist, uh, an environmental plaintiff's lawyer. So my answer to all those questions is going to be no. Um, let me just explain to you why that's true. Why that's my answer, not why it's true. I believe it's true, but of course that's an opinion. Um, so in order to uh, explain my uh, evaluation of these issues, I need to take you back years before your birth. I've been teaching environmental law now for 25 years, and it's now the case where my students don't uh, remember anything about what I call the environmental revolution, or even the state of the world, both legally and physically, at the time of the environmental revolution. I'm sure most of you know that in the late 60s and early 70s, we had what I call an environmental revolution in this country. Um, during the Nixon administration, Republican president, slim majorities in the House and Senate uh, for, for Democrats, um, we saw enacted uh, all of the major structural environmental statutes that currently govern federal, state, and federal private relations today with respect to the environment. In 1970, the National Environmental Policy Act, 
Also in the 1970, extensive Clean Air Act amendments that changed the structure of the Clean Air Act and, and set, for the most part, its current structure, of course, it was amended in 1990 pretty significantly, but, but major, major structural portions of it were set in place in 1970. In 1972, uh, substantial amendments to the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, which is what we now think of as the Clean Water Act, and in 1973, the Endangered Species Act. Dramatic revolution in the role of federal government with respect to the environment in those statutes. So if we want to ask ourselves, does the current implementation of those statutes go beyond what those Congresses intended? Uh, and what the president, the Republican president signed into law, we have to ask ourselves, what problems were they facing? What were they responding to? We also have to ask ourselves, what powers did they think they had at those times? So, what was the state of the fiscal world leading up to the environmental law revolution? Um, uh, you know, the first thing you may not know is that in the 50s and 60s and 70s, Rivers would regularly catch fire. Rivers were, in fact, simply industrial waste dumps that were kind of channels for industrial waste, untreated sewage, um, lots of large uh, garbage and other sort of commercial waste simply dumped into rivers to be either stagnate there or channeled downstream into a lake or the ocean. Um, there were many, many episodes of the sludge in the rivers catching fire. Here's a contemporary description of the Cuyahoga River, which runs through Cleveland. Um, the description is, as, and I quote, the river is a waste treatment lagoon. At times, the river is choked with debris, oil, scums, and floating gobs of organic sludge. Foul-smelling gases can be seen rising from decomposing materials on the river's bottom. That's what the world looked like to the Congress in the Congresses in the early 1970s. Um, there were several very, very uh, high-profile fires, which, of course, the river itself was not burning. That would be pretty impossible. But the, the junk in the rivers were burning, and it was hard to put out because water doesn't put that stuff out. Otherwise, it probably wouldn't be burning in a river. Um, so, so that's what's going on. In the 50s and 60s, there were major air pollution episodes, which sent thousands of people to the hospital, literally gasping for breath. Los Angeles was under various smog alerts that, that, that in fact killed hundreds of people and sent thousands of people to, um, uh, to the hospitals. And also, uh, major, very salient species, mostly birds, were simply dying off because of the unconstrained use of DDT, which was um, uh, rendering their eggshells too thin uh, for them to successfully reproduce. So, so, you know, when Rachel Carson wrote about it in Silent Spring, and, and it was perceived to be the big environmental issue of the day, it was like the climate change of our era, right? So, and so, and what was the legal world that Congress thought it was operating in in, in the 1970s? This may come as a shock to you, but in fact, in the early 1970s, there were perceived to be no, and I mean that no, Commerce Clause restrictions on the scope of federal power. In the last 50 years before Lopez, there, there basically the perceived wisdom was the Commerce Clause was not a limited enumerated power. It was a plenary grant of authority in Congress. So Congress thought at the time it had authority to do whatever it needed to do to uh, uh, reach these problems. And it also thought states weren't acting. Um, at the same time, because this was before the concept, not the concept of standing, but the development of standing law, before we had uh, the uh, environmental law revolution and the uh, health and welfare of administrative state, we didn't have a robust sense of what constituted standing. So Congress didn't know that about the whole constitutional minimum requirement for standing uh, that the court has been imposing. Uh, in the last 15 to 20 years. So what did Congress do in this context? It enacted sweeping legislation, substantively sweeping. The Clean Air Act sets federal minimum national ambient air quality standards, or directs the EPA to, excuse me, and says to the states, you've got to implement these. These are the baseline, you can't exceed. 
The Clean Water Act sets an incredibly ambitious goal to completely eliminate discharges into navigable waterways by 1985. I think it's suffice to say we're not there yet, um, but that's the goal. In 1972, the goal is 13 years later, no discharges into navigable waterways. Um, and the Endangered Species Act sets an absolute prohibition on the take of an endangered species by any person, anywhere. <coughs> Um, and as you all know, several years later, it shut down um, the TPA in the building of uh, a major dam. Um, so in addition to these expansive uh, substantive provisions, every one of these major environmental statutes has an extraordinarily uh, expansive citizen suit provision saying, you know what, we don't trust ourselves to enforce this. We may not have money, we may not have the political will, so all of you citizens, go out there and be private attorneys general and enforce these broad, expansive mandates. So in that context, uh, I suggest to you that it would be virtually impossible for current regulatory regime to exceed what those Congresses wanted. They wanted the world, they enacted into uh, uh, official statutes, and they hoped that all of us would enforce it. Um, since then, the reach of those statutes has been constrained somewhat, not particularly significantly, but somewhat by post-Lopez uh, decisions uh, 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 imposing the Commerce Clause as a limit on, on uh, federal authority, and much more significantly by the development of standing law uh, beginning in the mid-80s uh, in the context where it has now relatively fully developed into a law that makes it quite easy for regulated entities, industry, landowners, whoever's regulated by uh, under one of these environmental statutes to get themselves into court, and quite difficult, and, and probably even more difficult given the court's decision in Clapper just a couple of days ago, for environmental uh, plaintiffs under citizen suits enacted by the 1970s Congresses to get into court to enforce these. So, um, so I, I think it, it seems to me fair to say that uh, these statutes don't in any way um, extend the reach that the Congresses that enacted them intended them to reach. So, so that's my view of the first question. Second question, even if Congress meant this, is it unduly interfering with state sovereignty? I think you have to think about this issue two ways. Um, one is theoretically. Right, we all know about externality, externalities. We all know why certain decisions should be centralized and other decisions should be decentralized. Um, and, and it seems to me that environmental issues are the very essence of the sorts of decisions that shouldn't be decentralized to the states. States have played this great sort of federalism-based role uh, of experiments and you know, uh, uh, working out the different sorts of uh, regulatory regimes that work best for states, but that doesn't work with pollution. Pollution doesn't stay localized. Air pollution migrates. You have uh, a factory in Ohio um, having emissions that rain down in New England um, as acid rain. You have discharges into Lake Michigan and Chicago that walk, wash ashore in Milwaukee. You have the habitat of the endangered gray wolf, which spreads across five uh, northwest Pacific, Pacific Northwest states, which of those states would you pick to be the sovereign state? Do we let Illinois uh, determine what sorts of uh, effluents the in industry in Chicago can uh, flow into uh, Lake Michigan and just say to Milwaukee, sorry, states' rights? Um, so theoretically, it seems to me that for uh, pollution that doesn't uh, respect state boundaries, sovereignty can't respect state boundaries. Uh, legally, though, each of these statutes, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Endangered Species Act as implemented, provides ample room for state autonomy. So, um, you know, the Clean Air Act sets, uh, has an EPA set national ambient air quality standards, and the states implement those standards through state implementation plans. So the state of Texas can decide do we want to have more oil refineries in Beaumont and force Dallas to have light rail so that we get those cars off the road? Or do we want people to drive in Dallas and Houston and therefore have uh, fewer oil refineries? Um, 
So there's a lot of room for autonomy in those. And then I, I want to add one more thing. I know I'm, I'm sort of this is taking longer than I thought. I won't go over time. But let me also just say it's not just environmental plaintiffs who want centralized national regulation. In a world of national and multinational industry, they want national regulation as well. They don't want to have to build <coughs> an oil refinery in Beaumont differently than they have to build their oil refinery in Louisiana. They want to have all of the old, the, all the same technology requirements, all the same parts and pieces. So, so, um, so these these national regulations are in service of efficient national and multinational business. Now, let me just say a quick word about private property rights. That's, I think, one of the biggest issues these days. In particular, in the Clean Water Act, the um, uh, the Section 404 wetlands provision, um, and the Endangered Species Act. And I don't have much time, but I want to say two things about those. The first is, we have the Takings Clause, which is the federal protection uh, for private property rights, nor shall private property be taken uh, for public use without just compensation. It's important to understand what that is intending to do. It's part of the Bill of Rights. The Takings Clause is intended to protect Oh boy, I'm done. Yes. Um, it's intended to protect uh, uh, citizens from overreaching of the majority. I just have two things to say about that. One, um, the Clean Water Act Section 404 has been here for 40 years. Property rights protect reasonable expectations. It's hard to imagine somebody can buy a wetland these days and have a reasonable expectation to be able to dredge and fill it. Second, as I said, the Takings Clause protects individuals from government singling them out. The Endangered Species Act applies nationally wherever an endangered species is found, and those tend to be found in places the federal government doesn't predict. So this, it's, it's more like buying a piece of property where, as you, as you might have read about in Florida, you end up finding out you're on a sinkhole. It's horrible. It's tragic. It's unfortunate. You, you, all the houses around that sinkhole now are going to be evacuated, no building or anything. But it's not a singling out in a, in a sense in which you need a counter-majoritarian uh, provision of the Constitution to protect you. It's an unfortunate uh, act of nature, and that's what insurance is for. Um, thank you. undivided affirmation except for attack on pollution. And let me see if I can start this talk by trying to put this thing into perspective. And I begin first with the questions of entitlements and then turn to the questions of enforcement, either federal or state. And the question of the challenge here is, uh, when we try to organize a system of property rights, can we do better in terms of its articulation than the common law rules as they apply to both public and private property? And I think the answer to that question is that we cannot, and that the function, therefore, of the federal or the state governments in this issue is not, in effect, to create a new set of weird entitlements, such as the ones with respect to wetlands or with endangered species, but to make sure that we enforce the set of entitlements that are already there by requiring collective enforcement actions when private individual disorganized actions are insufficient to deal with the particular problem at hand. So if one were to start to ask, for example, about the famous fires in Cayuga and so forth, I think the following response is the case. The source of those particular difficulties lay in the fact that the local governments, often subject to political pressures by their major industrial constituents, did not enforce the standard 1536 rules associated with the creation of public nuisances and therefore essentially allow public resources to be treated as though they were a kind of a useless dump in which private parties could profit unilaterally. There's a prisoner's dilemma game in dealing with this thing, and the appropriate response to that is not to pass some kind of huge and wildly overambitious law, but rather under these circumstances to make sure that there is effective state enforcement, and if necessary, to allow private individuals who use the rivers to have standing in order to coerce public bodies to make sure that they clear the river up. And if you do that, then the question is how far do you go? 
And it's here, for example, if you listen to what Professor Blaze said, that all of a sudden we start to go wrong. If you go back to the private law of nuisance, there is, of course, a strong prohibition against pollution of neighbors and pollution of public waters, but it's also offset by a kind of a de minimis or live and let live rule, which says, in effect, once you get rid of 99% of the pollution and you've done 99 plus percent of the benefit, you don't spend an equal sum of money in order to get that last 1% down. So the moment you get anybody in a public body which comes forward with the proposition that we want to have a pollution-free river, then they have simply forgotten the principle of marginal benefit versus marginal cost, and have pushed too far with respect to this situation, and have spent all the energies working on the kinds of problems that don't need any solution, so that the environmentalists become the problem themselves. Not knowing when to quit is the fundamental mistake of the modern environmentalist movement. If it thinks in categorical terms, which says either we do everything or it's as though we've done nothing, they're sure to make a mistake. What was very critical about the private law under these circumstances um, was in effect that it understood this marginal principle. For those of you who would like to find its most elegant articulation, I suggest, indeed I think it should be required reading before graduation, Go back to the most prominent of the 19th century English um, libertarian judges, Baron George Bramwell, and his decision in Bamford and Turn, that were exactly these points are made with a great deal of force and elegance, and they are forgot by modern environmentalists in the way in which they think about the subject. So the first question, therefore, is how does this system of private rights work? And as I've indicated to you, exclusive possession means, amongst other things, the protection against the invasion by pollutions from other sources, subject to this constraint that de minimis or small kinds of situations are not to be remedied by an injunction, and in those cases where they're reciprocal, even damage actions are to be not allowed at all. Well, there are other kinds of so-called harms, and one of the terrible mistakes of the environmental movement is that when it uses the definition of harm, it forgets the common law distinction between those harms which are cognizable by legal action and those harms which are properly treated as damn them as square in Europe. Now, I'm a Roman law by training and by inclination, and it's a rather sad thing to have to say that they had a better grasp of these problems uh, close to 2,000 years ago than we seem to have today, but in fact that is the truth. And the basic argument that one wants to make about this is there are all sorts of things that can happen to you that leave you worse off than you were before, but if you understand how these particular harms fit into a larger calculus of social interaction, the last thing you want to do is to make them actionable. And so to give you the two most famous illustrations, one of them is that competition always hurts competitors who are less fortunate, but it doesn't mean we ought to enact a law of fair competition so that people cannot enter with new products to undersell established parties. And the second piece of common law on this subject is that you cannot say by virtue of the fact that somebody builds the same house on his land that you have built on yours, that by blocking your view he has committed a harm that ought to be regarded as actionable. If you're serious about that, then the first person is never going to be allowed to build at all because that would necessarily inhibit the right of the second person to build. So what you have to do is to understand these kinds of sequential issues are absolutely destructive. And the correct rule is to ask whether both building or neither building within the confines of nuisance law is the appropriate approach. And it turns out that under these circumstances, better it is that both build and that you have somebody blocking views because otherwise nothing whatsoever in the world gets done. And so when you start seeing environmentalists, either under common law notions or under some statutes, argue that you've got some kind of a protected view shed, what you do is you get into all sorts of absurdities, so that I've been involved in cases where somebody said, you know, he wants to build a model home on the other side of a hill, and the mere fact that he is building it is sufficient distress to me that I want to be able to protest and to stop this particular application. That is, I think, the definition of insanity, and unfortunately, it is much too much a part of the way in which the environmentalists achieve, and I don't care what federal state statute you pass, if it's a mindless idea as a matter of first principle, it doesn't become a sensible idea by virtue of the fact that somebody in Congress thinks that this thing is appropriate. So therefore, you have to...
But the moment you can start to put the environmental stuff on the particular developer, what you can do is you can coin money at will by simply announcing, if you wish to build on this land, what you now have to do is to buy for us 10 acres of land somewhere else, which you will put into perpetuity. How do you decide that it's 10 acres, 5 acres, or 2 acres? How do you decide whether or not the particular environmental restrictions have to be limited, as the plaintiffs and crews or the private individuals and crews argue, to the plot in question, or whether or not you have to repair some public infirmary, water bill, or something else far away from the premises? Well, the answer is there's no way in which you can decide that at all. So what they do, in effect, is they keep on making their position more stronger by simply announcing that they have greater and greater kinds of demands. That is an absolute abuse of government power, and it also leads to inefficient environmental results. The correct test under the takings clause in any and all cases runs as follows. We wish to have in public solution that land which is worth more to the state in its natural use than it is to the private developer as a piece of developed land. If, in fact, the state is now in a position where it can say to somebody, oh, what you have to do is to give us land worth X unless you, if you want to build, what the owner is going to have pair is the loss of development rights against the amount of things that he has to sacrifice, which gives you no measure of the social value of the goods in question. And what the right comparison to ask is whether or not the value of the land is greater in public than in private hands. And the only way you can do that is to unbundle the development question from the exaction question, and therefore, in effect, insist that the state pay for what it wants. And we know that the coup situation is a bunch of hot air. And the reason we know it is that the Florida people, who are as illiterate on this issue as is the federal government, were actually forced to pay for those development rights. They wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. So it turns out that if you want to get environmental law right, what you have to do is to understand the way in which property rights are put together and their benefits and their losses. There is absolutely nothing wrong with a version of the takings clause which says that you actually have to pay for land that you want to use for a wetland or any other purpose. In fact, it is exactly the correct way of doing things because it forces a democratic society to put these matters on budget. That eliminates the amount of political intrigue, the endless and pointless litigation that takes place, the waste of resources which does nobody any kind of good. What is wrong with the modern environmentalists is that they are dreadful with respect to matters of technique and questions of social organization. If I would have time, we could talk about the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. Um, the entire system there is a bungled set of confused propositions by people who simply do not understand what the basis of prosperity is in a free society. And that means, in effect, strong property rights, including strong nuisance laws, coupled with the constant override that if we wish to take private property for public use, whether we do it from one or from money, we pay for it. And once we do that, we will have higher levels of prosperity and higher levels of environmental performance. And believe me, there is nothing about the system of private property rights which says that we have to see the Cayuga River go up in flames. Thank you. Dictionary. Just the word environmental is kind of interesting. Um, 
The first uses are in the 19th century, people talking about Darwinian theory, Darwinian adaptation, and they talk about animals and the evolution of animals uh, in their environment. And there the word means habitat, something relatively local where a particular species are, and when it changes locally, the species either migrate or they have to adapt to their changing habitat. It's not till the 20th century that you start to get uh, references that are somewhat broader. People talk about environmental psychology, and uh, they mean the influences on human beings, but it's still somewhat focused. They, they're talking about uh, the family, the home, the neighborhood in which people grow up. I think the uh, earliest references to environment in a very large scale are um, uh, people in the Soviet Union who say, or people talking about the Soviet Union, who say um, uh, they will eliminate crime and change human nature by controlling the human environment. But even there, they only mean in the one-sixth of the Earth that was um, the Soviet Union. Uh, it's not until really the 1970s that you get terms like environmental advocate and environmental engineer, and what they mean is the whole natural world. Um, the first conference that the UN sponsored on the environment was in 1972, and already the first conference was the global environment. There is something inherently, let's say, Promethean about this. We need to control the whole world, because everything is related to everything, and therefore everything is part of the environment. I want to just start by saying, um, if you think about environment in this way, you're going to make yourself crazy, and you're going to make everyone else crazy, and you're going to have a very difficult time recognizing the rights of individuals to do things differently, because you have this kind of totalistic outlook. Now I want to talk just for a few minutes about the Clean Water Act, because I think that's a good illustration of this, just the trajectory of this. Um, it's, it's true, as Professor Dice said, the, the statute is from the early 1970s, but the applications of it have become more and more extreme and draconian, and even though the Supreme Court has repeatedly said, now wait a minute, this is going a little bit too far, um, the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers continue to think in this totalistic way, everything is connected to everything, the whole world is at stake, the environment is one vast, encompassing, connected thing, and so you cannot build your own house, because that is selfish. Uh, so the first um, case that really talked about this, um, United States versus Riverside Bayview Homes, was in 1985. And in 1985, the Supreme Court was still in a somewhat accommodating uh, mood, so it said, yes, we, we understand that although the statute, the Clean Water Act, refers to navigable waters of the United States, uh, we think that that means not just the actual navigable waters, but things that are adjacent because things that are adjacent will flow into the navigable water, so they were somewhat accommodating. Uh, Fifteen years later, they had this case, Solid Waste Agency of North Cook County versus the Army Corps of Engineers, in which the Army Corps of Engineers tries to stop a group of towns outside of Chicago, Chicago suburbs, from building a solid waste disposal site. Uh, this was actually um, something like 10 miles from any kind of flowing uh, water, but the site they had chosen was a former um, quarry, and sometimes after heavy rains, there would be accumulations of water, so it's like a little artificial pond, and the uh, federal government said, well, there is vegetation there, and migratory birds stop there, and that makes this of concern to the federal government. And the Supreme Court said, no, come on, that is really going too far. Uh, back off. This is not part of the uh, waters of the United States. It's a large puddle for a few weeks of the year. Unfortunately, that case appears in the US reports right after Bush versus Gore. So it was treated by the EPA as, you're just in a bad mood. <laughs> Uh, a few years later, you have the case of Rockland versus United States. Um, 
A guy in Michigan was trying to develop land. It was 12 miles from uh, any flowing stream. Uh, the EPA said, well, but it is uh, part of the year soggy, and it is adjoining areas which are a little soggier, and next to it are areas which are still more uh, soggy, and there are some man-made drainage ditches, which we consider to be uh, wetlands. Um, Justice Scalia said in this case, um, this is extending the definition of waters of the United States beyond parity, because you're now talking about drainage ditches as waters of the United States. You've moved from waters of the United States to moist land of the United States. And this is really out of control. And yet, the EPA continued on this path. So the decision last year in um, Sackett versus EPA, these people wanted to build a house in near a lake in Idaho. Uh, I suppose you could navigate the lake, but you couldn't get anywhere from that lake because it's not connected to any um, rivers. Uh, they were building a house not on the lake, not even one house removed from the lake, but some distance from the lake, and in between they had already built houses. And the EPA said, no, but we think it might get damp there sometimes. Uh, and they have this incredibly draconian uh, system of control, which is they send you a letter and they say, uh, we understand that you have laid down gravel. This is also really important, not a pollutant gravel. Gravel, as you may know, is a part of nature. <laughs> We've always had gravel. They were just moving it around a little bit. And the EPA said, okay, remove the gravel. If you do not remove the gravel, uh, you will pay $37,000 in fines. Uh, and we will double that because we told you not to and you did it anyway. So $75,000 a day. And it could be two or three years until you have a chance to challenge this if we decide to take an enforcement action against you. So within the space of in a few months, you get into insanely huge amounts of money. The Supreme Court, as you probably recall, last year said, no, 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 wait, this is really unfair. These people deserve to have a day in court to be able to challenge this, to challenge whether the EPA can hold this draconian uh, sanction over their heads. So here's the last thing that I want to say in response to the initial point of um, Professor Blex, uh, who said, well, you can We've had this now for 40 years. And so people should know if they buy lands that are moist, that the federal government might be hovering over them and telling them, move that ground, stop this, no. <laughs> but actually, you can't always know this, because uh, I suppose you can do a survey of the site, but it's really hard to know, can I get under one of the exceptions? Am I I'm, I'm five miles away? eight miles away, seven miles away, how far do I have to be from something that's navigable water? This is all very, very obscure and contested. And I think the reason this has gone on for 40 years is not that, oh, well, people have gotten used to it. It's that the challenges are hard to make and dangerous to make because the EPA threatens you with retaliation. It's like people living in totalitarian countries where there was, of course, a lot of violation of law. But when you violated the law, you lived in perpetual fear that you might be found out and something terrible might happen to you. This is not the kind of country we want to have. This is not the kind of system we want to have. So here's my modest suggestion. Um, we have these disputes about how to interpret the Clean Water Act as with other kinds of environmental legislation. Uh, there are books done. There are um, reference works on statutory interpretation, canons of interpretation, what kind of presumptions should courts bring to this. Uh, I've been surprised to discover, looking through these works, that um, there is not a presumption in favor of private property. There, there are a number of presumptions about federalism. Uh, they don't seem to help the states very much, but at least it gets into the discussion in court decisions. Um, it doesn't seem to me a stretch it is in the Constitution. Why not say the presumption is that Congress did not mean to deprive people of the use of their property without compensation? And then we can get into, you no, know, if they say clearly that yeah, they do mean to do that because they like totalitarian controls, okay, then we can decide was that excessive. 
But there's not even a presumption about this, which says to me, um, we've really gotten very, very carried away with the idea that the federal government needs to get its hands, its little pinkies, uh, its extenders into the remote, most remote corners of the country, lakes in Idaho. Something is really out of control, and I think it's the function of a legal system to provide some kind of boundaries, some kind of overall orientation, and it's about time we get started on that project. Thank you. Um, thank you to the Federal Society for putting me in this event. Um, I first want to give a shout out to uh, the delegation from Vermont Law School. There are nine Vermont Law School students here, and I think if you if you multiply the mileage uh, or, or air distance by the number of students, we probably have the best Federal Society chapter of any law school in the country. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I always enjoy participating in Federal Society events because I'm always provoked, um, uh, or I provoke. Uh, my favorite uh, experience at a Federal Society gathering was in, was in Washington, D.C., when I was giving a very thoughtful presentation about public ownership of wildlife, and I looked out in the audience, and, and much like you all, I had sort of you know, respectful, bemused looks on the, on the faces of most of the audience, but then I noticed one man in the, in the middle distance who was sadly shaking his head. And uh, I looked a little closer, and it was, it was Richard Epstein. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, came, he came up to me promptly after the end of my presentation. He said, John, John, how could you be so wrong? And I said, well, Richard, I was just parodying what the Supreme Court has been saying since the 1890s. He said, yes, yes, but they're so wrong. They're so wrong. <laughs> so, um, so I thought that what I would do with my time in, in order to, to provoke as much debate as I possibly could uh, when we talk, talk about climate change and then talk about the utility of the eminent domain power as a way of addressing uh, climate change. And in kind of a, a perverse way, uh, my, my talk will also get into the notion of the federal government uh, as, a, as a leviathan. I, I, since I have the podium now, I can't resist saying a few things about uh, how far Richard Epstein went wrong in his, in his talk about, about the takings clause. Um, his notion uh, that the, we should, the, the common law is the beginning and end of the definition uh, of property rights uh, here in the United States, and the only purpose of the takings clause is to make sure uh, that Congress does not find, define rights or responsibilities that go, go beyond the common law, uh, it simply makes no sense as a matter of constitutional law. If you, if you read the Constitution, and Richard, I have a copy of it here that, from the Cato Institute, no less, um, and the first words of the Constitution are, we the people. Uh, and then the Constitution goes on to describe other branches of government, which will be law-making institutions. Uh, Richard reads all of that uh, out of the Constitution. Uh, beyond that, uh, his reading of the takings clause has no basis in the language, much less uh, the original understanding. As my favorite conservative, my law professor, uh, Robert Bork, said, Richard Epstein's theories are very interesting. They just have no basis uh, in the Constitution. Um, on, on Coons, uh, I would just note that, um, that Richard is, is not making, is not addressing the issue in the case. The issue in the case is whether or not the Nolan and Dolan exaction standards that apply to government permitting apply in the situation where government has not imposed conditions on a permit, but has simply denied a permit uh, altogether. He, he's he's uh, addressing a, an anterior issue, which is whether or not you can impose conditions at all. Well, in Nolan, Justice Scalia, Scalia resolved that issue in the affirmative. Justice Rehnquist resolved that question uh, in the affirmative uh, in the Dolan case. Um, so, you know, Richard's theories are always interesting, um, but I think uh, it's fair to say that, that his argument uh, in Coons is very much a, a matter of tilting at windmills, and I think I think he's uh, he's so disappointed with the current very conservative Supreme Court uh, insofar as it's been addressing the takings issue. Uh, that he would, would have to acknowledge um, the same. So let me let me turn to what I want to talk about, and, and uh, Jeremy's going to help me uh, with this. I, I wish I had a clicker, but I don't. Um, so if you could, I'm going to talk very quickly about science. Now, I don't want to have a debate about science because I'm not a scientist, um, and I hope most of you are not either because um, we, we, uh, we don't want to go there. Uh, I'm going to present 
uh, what I understand the science to be, uh, which provides the predicate for the assertion that we have a serious challenge in terms of rising sea levels, which raises all sorts of interesting property questions. If you believe, you don't believe in climate change, you don't believe those seas are rising, then you don't need to pay any attention uh, to what I'm saying, and you don't have to engage with me on what I think are very interesting property issues. But I'm going to present a little bit of the science, and then that's, as I say, provides the predicate for a discussion uh, of some property issues. Uh, here's a schematic uh, showing uh, the solar radiation as it affects um, the, the Earth. Um, the greenhouse gases on the right are naturally occurring substances. The radiation back uh, to the Earth caused by greenhouse gases is one of the reasons we have an inhabitable planet. Uh, the expansion of the number of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, however, is, is according to the scientists, increasing uh, the amount of back reflection, warming the climate. On the left, we have reflection, reflected, uh, uh, reflection of, of radiation uh, from the surface. Uh, a lot of that occurs because of ice cover and snowpack. Um, the concern is, as the snowpack uh, shrinks, uh, that there'll be less reflection of radiation. Those two effects, scientists say, are going to produce um, uh, global warming. Um, here are some data uh, illustrating uh, the increase in atmospheric CO2 from uh, 1960 uh, to the present, a pretty clear uh, trend. Uh, go ahead. Um, here is concentrations of greenhouse gases uh, going back to the birth of Jesus Christ, a uh, fairly dramatic, obvious increase uh, in our era. Uh, here, here is another, a longer term look at this, going back many thousands of years. It's not as though we've lived historically, the climate has been stable. We've had ice ages, we've had uh, periods between ice ages, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere has gone uh, up and down, uh, but we are in a period uh, in the aftermath of the Industrial Revolution when the amount of carbon in the atmosphere is on un unprecedented level. Go ahead. Um, so according to the IPCC, this goes back now four or five years, they're in the process of producing their next uh, comprehensive report, um, but to be conservative, uh, for the purpose of this conservative audience, I'll just go uh, rely on this older report, uh, which they predict an increase of 0.2 centigrade per decade uh, over the next several decades. And then, of course, when you get to the end of the century, it gets hard to predict. But they say between 1.8 centigrade and centigrade and 4.0 4 centigrade increase in temperature. Dramatic, unprecedented in, in, mod, in the modern era. Uh, that is predicted to lead to changes in precipitation patterns, increases in, in, in the concentration of heavy precipitation events, changes in stream flows, reductions in crop fields, increases in wildfire, and most importantly, for the purpose of my talk, thermal expansion uh, of the ocean and melting of the ice sheets. Um, so here is uh, more uh, information on increase in, in global mean temperature um, uh, over the last uh, century or plus. Um, so then we get to sea level rise. Uh, based on increased temperature, uh, the scientists predict that we will see increased sea level rise. Uh, over the last century, uh, there was a historically unprecedented, at least in the modern era, uh, eight inches increase in sea level rise. Uh, the, the IPCC in 2007 predicted that the sea would rise between seven and 23 inches by the end of the century. Uh, NOAA, uh, as part of its preparation for the next uh, imminent uh, national climate assessment, uh, did an evaluation of the available scientific evidence and said, with 90% confidence, uh, the sea will rise between 8 inches and 6.6 .6 feet by the end of the century. Um, obviously, a great range of uncertainty. 8 is basically sort of a continuation of the trend line. Uh, I think if you read between the lines, Noah is saying it's more likely to be in the, in the higher range than in the lower range. Um, if you take a more catastrophic view of our future, the Greenland, Greenland uh, over a course of many centuries, uh, 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 loses all of its ice. The West Antic Antarctic ice shield uh, melts. Well, then you're talking about 25 to 35 feet. If you're talking about all the ice we have uh, in, the, in the world, if that all melts, well, then we know we're talking about 250 feet. I don't think we have to focus on the 250 feet, but just to give you an outer bound for the discussion. Um, so here's some data uh, on sea level rise from 1880 to 2000, significant, same pattern as followed with temperatures. 
Um, so, so what does this mean on the ground uh, in terms of, of coastal areas in the United States? Uh, here's the Albemarle Sound and the Pimlico Sound, uh, and, an indi and an indication of what areas would, would be inundated uh, with increases in sea level of 1.3 feet, 3.3 feet, and 4.6 feet. Uh, even at 1.3 feet, which is a very modest prediction, uh, you're talking about significant uh, losses of land. Uh, here, a little more dramatically, uh, in southeastern United States, um, six, they have at the top 6.6, 16.6, 32. Um, even at the lower end, you're talking about six substantial losses of, of, of land. Uh, as you get into the higher ranges, you know, the, the catastrophe is really quite astonishing if we ever get to that one. Uh, here's a dramatic uh, picture of lower Manhattan with about a, a, a 20 uh, foot uh, rise in sea level just for illustration purposes. Uh, and here's the impact of five meter sea level rise in Florida uh, and in, in Southeast Asia. Okay, so uh, what to do? Uh, you know, we don't know, there's gonna be a lot. I think I'm gonna posit that it's gonna be a lot. It could be a hell of a lot, but we don't need to worry about a hell of a lot. A lot is good enough. So what are the solutions? If you can just take through this. Um, uh, the free market solution, you know, this is Brad Pitt, uh, the Hollywood guy getting in bed with the libertarians, that's one. Um, huh. uh, the common law solution, I'll talk about that, keep going. Um, stop the beach from moving, that's another solution, keep going. Um, the Highlands Galveston elevation strategy, uh, the Andrew Cuomo Andro solution, and the eminent domain solution, what I'm going to advocate here today. So we'll quickly take through those. Keep, keep going. Uh, here's the common law solution. Uh, as everybody who's, who's uh, uh, taken water resources know, uh, it knows the, the mean high water line is the boundary between public and private ownership. Uh, with erosion and accretion, the boundary between high and low water, between public and private ownership uh, moves. Uh, one could anticipate that with a rising sea, the extent of public ownership will gradually expand uh, and the amount of private ownership will diminish. In other words, with the rising sea, the amount of submerged lands will increase, those are publicly owned, therefore public ownership will expand. And in a sense, you could say our, our property law system is beautifully adapted uh, to deal with a changing uh, uh, climate. Um, the the um, one issue is whether or not that old common law regime should hold true uh, in the modern era. One of the premises of the common law rule is that when you bought pro property, you really didn't know whether you were going to lose land or you were going to gain land. And so you, you were sort of, as a doctrine that at least ab initio was, was fair to all concerned. If, if we're dealing with a situation of chronic erosion, one might question whether the foundation of the, uh, the, the loss of the, uh, the logical foundation of the common law rule requires some adjustment. But setting that problem aside, you could say that the common law rule uh, is adapted, except for the fact that uh, it, 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 it provides a property solution only when the mean high water line has actually inundated private land. Uh, and in a sense, all hope is lost. Uh, the more immediate problem we face is lands that are going to be subject to recurring uh, flooding, uh, frequent flooding, to the point of inhabitability, but not yet in public ownership. Um, so if you can continue. Um, so this is the, the libertarian uh, Brad Pitt solution uh, in the lower ninth ward. Uh, this area in the picture is something like 10 feet below uh, sea level. It was, it was inundated uh, during the uh, Hurricane Katrina, uh, Brad Pitt led a, a, a generous, very high profile effort using his own money and the money of uh, friends and acquaintances uh, to, to build new structures uh, in, uh, here and there in the Lower Ninth Ward and other residents of the Lower Ninth Ward uh, return. Uh, uh, you know, maybe, that's, maybe that's the solution that, that, that some would favor. Uh, it seems to me it's sort of a failure of, of collective action here uh, to come up with a, a, a livable, uh, safe, healthy, viable community. Um, uh, so the other solution is to, is to just push back, right? To dump a whole lot of sand into the ocean uh, as fast as you can and keep going. Uh, this is Destin, Florida, which gave rise to the Stop the Beach Redarsion case. Uh, in that case, of course, the Supreme Court said, well, the public has a right to fill in public highlands and there's no infringement on private littoral rights. As a result, and therefore there's no takings issue, uh, but the more interesting question is one of policy is it makes sense to spend enormous 
uh, amount of money, a lot of it from the federal government, and that's a recurring theme here, uh, in, a, in an effort which may well prove to be fruitless to, to, to ward off the state. One more slide. Uh, this is from Amsterdam, where, of course, they have much larger engineering structures uh, designed to ward off the sea. There are proposals to put something like this, except much bigger, at the mouth of, of New York Harbor. Um, query, where is the money going to come from from that, and are they going to provide a long-term solution? Um, here's a uh, sort of a poor picture of Highlands, New Jersey, uh, 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 flooded as a result of Hurricane Sandy. Um, the proposal now on, on the table for Highlands, which I gather is modeled after the solution that Galveston came up, to, uh, came up with uh, as a result of the 1900 hurricane uh, that devastated that city, is to increase the uh, elevation of the city by about 25 feet. Uh, just get a whole lot of dirt. Take down the buildings, take down the streets, or move them to the side, build up the, the elevation by 25 feet, and go from there. Uh, the Cuomo plan, do I have two more minutes? Uh, the Cuomo plan is basically uh, to take uh, $400 million of federal funds and do a voluntary buyout uh, of, of Sandy Ravage property. Uh, this, the payment would be at the pre-storm full market value. In other words, not the actual market value of the property after it's been through a hurricane, but the, but the pre-storm value. Then a variety of bonuses would be paid if uh, area, homes were particularly hazardous areas, uh, or if, or if uh, people were willing to group together so that they moved out of an entire block. Um, uh, in Governor Cuomo's words, there are some parcels that Mother Nature owns, which is a very odd property theory here because he's proposing to buy these things which he thinks nature already owns. And then finally, um, uh, we have Suzette Kilo um, um, and the Kilo House and in New London going, so I'm running out of time. Dred Scott, you know, the Cato Institute, Institute for Justice, the most vilified, the worst, the most horrible decision uh, in, the, in the history of the Supreme Court. I disagree. Uh, here, New York, is the, this is the challenge facing New York. The, and it seems to me that this is tailor, a challenge tailor-made for the sensible application of the eminent domain power, to pay a fair price for people who've been benighted enough to live in these hazardous areas, using maybe not federal funds, but local funds, judiciously, uh, in order to get people uh, out of harm's way. Um, so I get to, um, and there are a whole variety of issues. This is a public use, no question. Who should decide this, federal, state, level, uh, or local? What level of government pays? What level of government decides? How to define just compensation? All sorts of different, difficult issues. Uh, but I suggest to you that of all the possible alternatives available to deal with what I've started a positive that we have this problem, that the best solution available to us is the eminent domain, the use of the eminent domain power. And with that, thank you very much for the additional time.
Efficiency is important, no doubt. I'm a law economist sort of kind of person. Uh, yeah, it's very important. It's not the only important thing society cares about, in my opinion. Um, okay, assume I'm wrong about that. Efficiency, no, oh, yes. I <laughs> Efficiency is the be all and end all of the property rights. And the probably, I guess, the most important mechanism for civilized society to order property rights in an efficient manner to allow the market to uh, meet social needs according to willingness to pay, that sort of thing. Uh, anybody who spent any serious time in a serious economics course knows that in order for free markets to be fully free and efficient, there are certain uh, irreducible minimum criteria for what the market has to look like. You have to have unlimited, interchangeable, uh, perfectly interchangeable assets, <laughs> which can, with no barriers to entry, no limited assets, um, you know, you don't, you don't have bilateral monopolies, you have uh, uh, free actors, uh, the sellers are price takers, the buyers are price takers, nobody sets prices. You know, the market for land isn't that. It's not widgets. Uh, microeconomics is a theory of widgets. Land is not a widget, and land is unique uh, in ways that make markets not free and fair. Uh, finally, microeconomics meet behavioral economics. People don't act rationally, and people particularly don't act rationally with respect to their property. So whatever we can say about efficiency, and we can probably say a lot, there is of course a market for land. There are ways in which lots of parcels of land are fungible. If you've looked at any of these subdivisions out west of Austin, every single house looks just like every single other house. And probably we can just go down the efficiency analysis pretty darn far. But at some point, you're going to run into a unique parcel of land, bilateral monopolies. The free market analogy simply collapses. Well, <laughs> I, don't, I really don't know where to begin. So let me just start with the last remarks, which I think are wrong on every particular. First of all, you have to know what the economic definition of efficiency is, and it's not a means to ends question. It is essentially an effort to try and figure out the Pareto improvements that are makeable in order to get to a Pareto optimum. And it turns out that half of the things that I wrote in the takings books were about bilateral monopolies, about externalities, about behavioral stuff. That's all part of the picture. And if you listen very closely to Professor Blaze, you were told that there's some other thing outside of efficiency which you must define, which we have to do, but we never know what it is. And so what it is, it's a trump that sort of sits there brooding on the presence. <laughs> So it's never defined in an operative way, and then whenever somebody starts to put it forward, it turns out it's simply part of the theory. So um, the takings book was about coercion, and that was, of course, when non-market institutions are necessary. Bargaining the state was about bilateral monopoly and why it is that you have to constrain the government in the way in which it deals. Uh, friction and transactions, of course, are part of the Kosian revolution. And the only way in which you can understand markets is to figure out how you minimize transactions costs in these variety of settings. And anything that you want to talk about can be put into this framework. There is no other framework out there. No other person has done it. The behavioral economic stuff is essentially a curlicue. It's important in certain cases. But it's probably a third order issue when you're comparing it to such things as common stupidity, um, which suddenly seems to be a behavioral defect that they're willing to talk about, and all of the sort of public choice issues that come up in incredible levels. Now, that's just the start of it. Now, let me say a couple of other things. And here, what I want to do is I want to criticize uh, Jeremy for being a wimp. Um, <laughs> on, on, on some of these issues, not that he's wrong, but I mean, when you start to sort of say that we want to have a presumption for private property as a construction matter, it's much too weak because now you could get a Congress which believes everything that Professor Blaze has said to simply reverse the presumption one way or another. What you need to do is to have a strong theory, and what the strong theory has to do is to deal with at least two questions. One of them is when you introduce public force to enjoin behavior. And this is the power of the private-public comparisons. If you're talking about this as a situation as I do, that the common law got it right on efficiency, which it did, um, then in effect, one of its rules is how do you deal with uncertain future harms, to which the rule was always wait for imminent peril before you would join, and then make sure there's a strong strict liability damage action after the effect so that people will step away from harm's way before they get into trouble. 
The problem with the environmentalists is that they require all these pre-clearance permits at ridiculous levels so that you get the farce associated with the Sackett case, when in fact all it is is just a form of interwar behavior by a government agency which does not know anything about property rights or anything. And if you want to defend that decision on efficiency grounds or moral grounds for beating up small people because you have the power, be my guess. It's an odious thing that they did and they should be condemned for doing it. And the second thing. I mean, you know, the other question, Jeremy, you're wrong on the knowledge point, and you're wrong on the knowledge point. <laughs> what happens is, I know, the standard old Roman joke was that, you know, I'm going to go out on the public street, I'm going to give everybody an announcement that I'm going to beat them up, and then I'm going to give them a few shekels in order to make them feel good. You giving notice can be a tool of terror, if in fact what you're trying to do is to say, don't you do this because we'll get that. And when people have to buy land with notice of the fact that the government is going to restrict its development, what you do is you kill the alienation rights. The correct view in all of these cases is the common law view on privity, which says that if the land is owned by X and there's a government regulation one way or another, the assignee of the property takes whatever rights the assigner of the property had to protect against that particular imposition. He's neither better nor worse off. That's a common law rule that starts with contracts. It goes everywhere else. It is the efficient rule. It is the correct rule. And it, it, it's just a regime of terror for somebody to say, well, we're going to put environmental restrictions on today. Anyone who buys it tomorrow gets it. You kill the land market. Now, with respect to my good friend, Marissa Echeverria, yes, my head is still shaking in disbelief that everything is <laughs> um, I'm just going to forget about the environmental stuff uh, on the planet stuff. Well, not forget about it. But the, the last solution is insanity. Um, you do not want to buy out people who have taken risks and pay them for the pre level, you're going to get it again. The thing we should have done was to make sure there is no federal insurance for people who build in lowland. So that the harm in question is a function of subsidized development. And in fact, you're not talking about a hurricane, Sandy, which was as severe as the Galveston hurricane. It was the third order, it wasn't a third order storm, it was a relatively minor storm. But everybody's building by the beach. Well, if they want to make those mistakes, I don't think the rest of us have to bail them out. What should we do? Well, if you looked at the storm coming up and going into the tunnels, some idiot might have been able to think of the fact that if you close off the Bowery tunnels from the lake at a cost of a million dollars, you could get the subway system running up uh, and avoid billions of dollars worth of losses. So, I mean, they're just not doing it. On the Dolan case and the Nolan case, again, just completely wrong. Of course, I know what the whole thing said. I wasn't talking about that. Tell me why the doctrine of mitigation is efficient. Well, you mentioned Dolan. Well, in fact, this case doesn't come within Dolan. Dolan was a pretty good decision, actually, because what it said was is that the only thing for which you can exact are the things that you can punish if they occur. And so that, in fact, if, or if you, in fact, uh, uh, are going to pollute to flood somebody, we could have a condition there which says if you want to build, you can't flood or pollute. And, in fact, if we want you to provide a benefit, then we have to compensate you for that. That's exactly where it is that the law wants to be. But the germaneness test of Justice Scalia gets you into absurdities because now, in effect, you can always say that environmental protection is germane to building somewhere else, whereas building a sports arena is not, and it gets you to exactly the wrong thing. If you have to do to say that I'm wrong is to explain why it is that the ability to make one person bundle a good with another gets you to efficient results by any standard of public exchange. It's not private market, public exchange, and you can't do it. The doctrines are hopeless. And as to the environmental change stuff, there are two ways of looking at this album. You know, all of those graphs there are not correct in the sense that we have now had over the last 15 years an increase of carbon dioxide of about say, 30, 35%. And there are two ways to describe the intent of climate change. One is to say that all of the hottest years in recent time have occurred within the last 10, which is true. And the other thing which is true is there's been no increase in temperature during this period. That is the same now, roughly speaking, globally as it was in 1998. And as you see the shrinkage of the ice in the north, what it turns out, you see the increase in the size of the Antarctic. Uh, water levels are up relatively trivially. I mean, what you really have to do is these guys have been predicting this for 15 years, and even their own supporters indicate that they're at the lower level of the estimates. But well, what are they missing? They simply have a model which is pathetically weak. If you think that the only thing that you want to put as an independent variable is carbon dioxide as opposed to a thousand other things which actually influence this stuff, the richer the model, the more difficult it is, which is why it is that they don't talk about global warming anymore. They talk about climate change. 
And it turns out that carbon dioxide is a very weak driver of climate change taken in the aggregate. There's so many solar phenomena out there which make a great deal more. Remember, Greenland was green when it was taken over. Labrador was called Vineland before they grew true. It wasn't global warming that made those places warm and cold. But you have to understand, as given the huge cycles that we've had over the last even 10,000 years, this global warming stuff is, you know, doesn't matter very much relative to the other forces. And if you don't understand them, you can spend fortunes in time wasting your efforts, stopping things that may never occur. It's very difficult to hit the sweet spot of spending money, which isn't wasted either way, either because you don't need it or because even if you do it, the Armageddon is going to happen anyhow. So we really have to understand what's going on here. And unless you understand this, not microeconomics is perfect competition only. That's silly. You have to understand how it is that you put institutions together to deal with the destruction of forced exchanges where all the problems that everybody's talked about are there. And it turns out everything which has been done on that issue has been done at a level of ineptitude. And in fact, when I listen to John, I say, ignorance knows no limits with respect to these issues.
Yes, we should not just have John Chance before you have a question. John? And how long do I have? I'll say three minutes. Three minutes? You went over on your basic Well, let me just say a couple of things. One is that, is that, um, is that Richard uh, reflects the disease of all law school, Yale law school graduates, which is the smartest, <laughs> smartest people on the earth, they can figure anything out. And, you know, I don't think Richard knows squat about climate science. I don't know squat about climate, climate science. And I, I laid out here what I think a whole series of reputable scientists say, and then I wanted to have a property discussion about it. Now, you know, I, I'm willing to believe, you know, there are a couple of percentage points chances that this is just a conspiracy of the loony left. There's also a fair percent number of percentage chances that this is just, you know, an, an, an error of scientific enterprise that's sort of engaged in group think and, and we're wrong. But, you know, our views on property, our views on sort of the role of government, really should be independent of, of scientific fact. Um, and, you know, I don't know whether this is correct, but I'm sure that Richard doesn't know that it's incorrect. And so the question is, how do we go forward in a, in a, in a, in a climate uh, of uncertainty, when there are sort of substantial reasons to believe um, that, there, that there are concerns? And I think the most immediate place where that's going to come to, to ground is in, is in sea level rise. Now, with respect to my very thoughtful presentation regarding the use of eminent domain, um, I'm entirely with Richard on, on getting rid of the, the, the insurance program, the flood insurance program. And there's a wide uh, uh, spectrum of ideological forces lined up uh, around that idea. Not very successful so far, but you know, setting that aside, we have a lot of stranded real estate. People who bought, uh, built uh, in the coast uh, without uh, expecting uh, that the seas would rise. Now the question is, what to do with that? Well, no, they are they are benighted, uh, and I accept that, and, and I'm sort of with you a lot, a lot of the way uh, in terms of, sort of letting people uh, make do and, and solve their own problems, because it's not the government's problem to solve. But I want to emphasize that the, the primary uh, proposal that is being touted out there is the pro-property rights proposal. That, well, well, if that's the way it's being advertised, it provides compensation, full compensation, fully protects the private property rights of coastal property owners. I don't see the Cato Institute and the Heritage Foundation standing up and saying, all those benighted people in, in New Jersey who are talking about their private property rights are, don't know what they're talking about. It's all BS. Those are not private property rights. They, they, don't, owe, they don't deserve compensation. So, you know, and then finally, just on the, on the Nolan and Dolan point, um, I mean, Richard's objection, I mean, what his concern is, is he says the common law baseline is what, is what should govern. And that, and that Scalia, where Scalia went wrong, where Rehnquist went wrong, is in saying we can credit the legislative branch and the executive branch to define cognizable harms that, that regulatory authorities can properly address in the context of, 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 a, of a permitting process. And if the conditions are meet an essential next, next, nexus test and re reach a rough proportionality test, they're perfectly constitutional. Now, Richard's fundamental objection to that is he says the legislative branch and the executive branch have no business defining harms. That is left to 18th century common law judges, and we should be satisfied with that. All right, we have about 15 minutes for questions from the audience. We have any? Sorry. Here, the mic. Uh, take the microphone. Um, so my question is, um, what role courts have here? Like, what are the trends in the way courts are using Chevron deference uh, that might affect this debate? And also, um, some of these doctrines, there was an idea for a presumption in favor of property rights. You know, what about like the absurdity doctrine, for instance? These, you know, these statutes are very complex, and when you start applying them to very specific situations on the ground, there are absurdities everywhere, at least as a law clerk, that's my view of it. And I don't know why there are absurdities. Why shouldn't Congress just have to confront those absurdities? The court should just say, yeah, that's absurd, but that's what you said, and that's it. I guess what I'm saying is I question whether there's any congressional intent going on here with these statutes that are sold and now incredibly complex and have all of these crazy results. And I'm wondering what a law clerk should do, what should courts do here? I, I just want to jump in on one point. You, you mentioned the absurdity doctrine. Uh, and as Richard said, the, the, the terrorizing of the sackets 
it seemed like, like this is insane. This cannot be government in a free country where you know we will ruin you and destroy you and go after your children. Uh, five circuit courts looked at that policy and said, no, 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 it's okay. So the absurdity doctrine doesn't work if people's frame of reference is, well, yeah, the government sometimes terrorizes people. That's not absurd. That could have been what Congress intended. So, <laughs> so I think you need a canon that has more substance than just, is this you know, verbal. Right? There can be very extreme policies, which in the court's understanding are not absurd, right? So you, you, you need to say, we're not asking, is this insane? We're asking, is it dreadful, which is different. Yeah, but um, look, the Chevron Doctrine is another one of the great menaces of our time, because it is very thing. Matters of statutory constructions are for courts. They're not for administrative agencies. Matter of basic factual interpretations within that framework are for agencies and not for courts. And the Supreme Court and the Middle Courts have flipped that thing over to immense kind of harm. Well, this, we agree about one thing. Well, we agree about lots of things. I agree on that, too. I mean, it's, just, it's a disgrace. And, and you know, the great point to understand about Chevron, it was a perfectly sensible plan which could have been defended on normative grounds. And you didn't have to give deference and mystery to statute in order to do so. And the second point, the Chevron deference does not apply to constitutional challenges. And at that point, the argument here is that deference is to Chevron, is rational basis is to constitutional law. And again, I'm going to say it. Everybody says these 19th century, that's wrong, they're Roman basically. The conceptions of property rights are wrong. And they can't explain how they want to improve it. And in fact, if you could show a Pareto improvement over it, that's exactly what you're supposed to do, and you will win without having to pay cash compensation. The system has that built into it. But current situation, in effect, under Congress, is a scandal. They talk about the navigable waters of the United States. And what these guys do is they say it's like the Congress, because anything that touches the navigable waters of the United States, we think we'll do it. And they enjoin something. The correct rule is to say, we'll put traces on your land, unique molecules. If they get themselves into the navigable waters of the United States with pollutions above a certain concentration level, then we will require you to make adjustments. That's the correct way in which to do it, not by having these insane overbroad, interwarm type actions. I was thinking of that question for Mike over here. Hi. Um, I'll try to be <clears throat> somewhat rather or summarize and brief. You know, I look at the EPA and listen to uh, Professor Weiss's initial statements about rivers on fire and fear. And the initial intent of all these government agencies and these now federal leviathans is seemingly altruistic and great. And now, they, now I see the EPA, 40 years later, as the poster child for government overreach when you have professional bullies inside these agencies doing things to the Sacketts. And I would argue that the Sacketts are just a Darwinian example of people that got to that level. And there's a whole lot of other Sacketts that don't get to that level. And it's not just the EPA. So how do we execute properly when we have these great intentions? Because none of us want burning rivers and beach houses leaving away and drowning in the fields. Or, you know, I don't want my property too moist either. But how do we actually really execute? Well, we go right back to the common law rules and ask yourself whether or not if you had strong enforcement of public nuisance law, you would ever have rivers burnt. The problem there is with property <coughs> rights. It's not that they're strong property rights. And the older systems essentially allow public agencies to bring on behalf of the public at large actions for nuisances that met the same standards that were actioned by private property laws. So I'm, I'm going to ask Lynn, I'm going to ask John, you know, Sergeant um, whether or not there's anything wrong with basically that entitlement approach by their own moral standards. Because you can do that without basically having habitat protection without compensation. Do you think AEP was incorrectly decided? And the, and the, Which one? The, the, the climate, the, the tort, climate tort lawsuit in the Supreme Court, and the people who claim that they've been adversely affected by carbon emissions in the Midwest and other parts of the, of the world should be able to bring common law tort actions to redress their injuries. Yeah, well, the common law rules on this are better than we're talking about. If you go back to 1535, just read it. So you think no, I mean, they law. got it right. What they said is that diffuse harms like that do not go to private action, but they require, in that case, the court leave for administrative sanction. So the argument in those particular cases is that the private rights of actions are absurd. Uh, the claim that you want to have for government intervention, if you could make out the substantive elements, would be correct. That is, the whole point of this is that collective action problems, to which we prefer, are, in fact, the justification for public action, but just because you collectivize the action doesn't mean you change the normative standards which you employ. Otherwise, you get political arbitrage. 
And the situation is you can't win by injunction on the merits, so what you do is you go for government action. If you have the same standard, then you will have an efficient choice between public and private remedies. So again, it's the efficiency point. The system is that these characters don't, at the Supreme Court level, for the most part, don't know how you put this thing together, but they were right, wrong, half right, on the basically no private right of action, but they did it on preemption grounds. And you know, that was a mistake. But you, but you think the, the, res the result was correct. It should have been I think, I think the right. result was correct, and I think the EPA should look at this. The dreadful decision was, of course, Massachusetts against the EPA, where he absolutely tortured the statute to get carbon dioxide in. And the only way it works, of course, is then to change the quantities which trigger into action. And you could go back to that history from the beginning of time. Every structural element of the statute is inconsistent with what he said. And you know, it's just terrible that Justice Stevens can play those games and be applauded as being a faithful executor of the statute. The bottom line is you're saying environmentalists should be left to the common law remedies, and the common law remedies aren't going to help them either. No, I say in effect that the common law rules should touch up the entitlements, and the way they break down on enforcement, you need public action. That's why you have to have public action on the whichever river it turns out to be, right? Um, in Cleveland, and why it is that when you're dealing with pollution, you need air control pollution, but you know, Lynn refers to the FIPS and the SIPS and the so forth. That's a terrible remedial device because what happens is it gives too much local discretion as to which of the people in the pollutant world you favor and which ones you struck down. And what you need is a uniform tax across these individuals so as to get efficient abatement. All I can say is if the, if the Clean Air Act is such a horrible thing, uh, I personally am happier to be breathing the air in 
And so you just apply the same Roman common law system to this to see whether or not the public injunction is overbroad. That is, the position I'm taking insists on public injunctions against tailpipe emissions because class actions don't work and letting unabated pollution go is not a market response. It's just a way of killing everybody. I'm from Tulane, Austin. Uh, we're very appreciative of the Brad Pitt approach and prioritization coming in and cleaning up the government's mess. And on that note, I wanted to know what you all thought about the research that's been done on more private ownership of public lands instead of depending on the government to promote these causes of action, having giving private owners control of this land and having them have causes of action against polluters. And would that be a more efficient way to protect the environment than giving up to the government and all of their qualities? Yes. And in fact, nature convergencies or conservancies are exactly that method. And when you start dealing with public lands, what is the interesting thing is they cannot get the mixed-use solutions that private owners are willing to do. So the Audubon Society has all sorts of oil leases on its property where they say we want greater protection, for which we will then take a lower royalty. When it gets on public lands, everybody doesn't have this buying and selling incentives, so they insist that there be no drilling at all. The other guys want huge amounts of drilling, and you can't get the equal marginal solution so that the last drop of oil is roughly in value equal to the last drop of environmental protection. And the government or agencies and the management of public lands are yet another one of the chronic national disgraces we have. <laughs> so one of the, when you talk about the nature conservancy, so you have to be very clear about the role they're playing. They're not using membership money in order to buy up land. It's not a collective you know, action uh, enterprise. It's a lobbying uh, enterprise which lobbies state and, and federal legislatures for money. They're a rent-seeking organization. Oh, we don't want those. I'm talking about private contributions. God forbid that the government should okay, subsidize so those things. Land conservation. <laughs> 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 land conservation. I could just give it to an agency in power and give it the government instruction. Look, one of the great sins of our time is having private charitable organizations of any sort getting direct government grants, which corrupts, as opposed to charitable deductions, which essentially decentralize these decisions. Okay, uh, my name is Vitaly Katz, I'm from the University of Florida, and um, this question is primarily for Professor Epstein, but anyone else can jump in. Uh, Professor Epstein, you obviously favor private causes of action, and the collectivization of said actions, all the same Pareto framework would obviously apply to those considerations. And I was wondering what you thought of the proposal by the libertarian Justice Douglas, uh, taking that to its natural conclusion, whether or not trees and lakes and rivers and such should have standing as a matter of legal fiction, uh, like corporations and, uh, and REM actions and the like. Uh, well, look, I'm, uh, that's silly, but there's a serious point there. The, uh, the Justice uh, Scalia's approach on this is moronic, uh, I mean, incorrect. Uh, but <laughs> essentially, the problem is this. The jurisdiction of the United States is to all causes in law and in equity. And it, as a technical matter, the inequity allows, the inequity, that is the part in equity, allows for injunctive relief for open virus actions by the government so that you don't have to prove discrete harms, which means that when it comes to the constitutionality of a piece of legislation, any citizen or any uh, person inside the United States or taxpayer should be allowed to do it. So the key mistake here is, is, is Massachusetts against Mellon, one of the worst decisions ever. It was unanimous. Uh, but it's terrible. And the environmentalists are surely right when they want to be able to say that they should be able to challenge these programs, like the challenge to the Endangered Species Act and the use of American monies overseas, whatever that case was. Uh, what? Blue one. I mean, it was just a you know, bad decision. Um, the question, though, is once you get to the merits, do those guys win? And you know, in some cases, the answer is yes. All right, this will be the last question. Thank you very much. I'm Nadia Nessel. I'm from Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I have a uh, comment for Professor Blakes and then a question for those who are discussing eminent domain and takings clause. The sinkhole to which you refer in Florida is a common occurrence and that's generally insured. Uh, the homeowner has to take out insurance in order to get a loan against sinkholes. I think the sinkhole you're talking about, the larger one, is in Bayou Corn in uh, Assumption Parish, Louisiana where 150 families have been evicted due to the failure of a brine cavern uh, run by the Texas uh, um, brine company. Texas brine company is out there trying to stabilize the, uh, um, the property. However, these families have been evicted now for since September 3rd, I believe it was August 3rd. 
and they're talking about um, a potential buyout. Now, that would be a private buyout, not an EPA mandated buyout. Um, I myself was a Katrina victim, lost everything. And uh, again, it was the private domain that rescued me. Uh, Road Homeless offered me half the value for my empty lot. And my next door neighbor, a toxic torts attorney doing post Katrina litigation, paid me full value. So I'm very happy for the private market. The issue I have is in a, uh, an article written that I wrote with, in conjunction with Walter Block. I'm not sure the takings clause is effective at all uh, for two reasons. First, um, after the Berman and uh, line of cases, Berman Kilo, what is defined as a public taking has essentially been reduced to whatever the local uh, government <coughs> entity wants it to be. Um, Can we get to a question? We're, and, we're the second, and the second part is what cons constitutes fair market value because you'd be forced to sell, it's not a fair market. So, Professor Epstein, would the takings clause and the eminent domain power actually help us here or not? Well, I'm going to give a short answer because we're running out. Uh, the permanent park case is, is dreadful on what is the public use, but all the cases we're talking about for environmental protection simply don't raise serious public use issues under even a correct definition. And the point about the just compensation clause is just compensation clause should include consequential damages above and beyond market value, and it doesn't, so it leads to excessive takings. All right, thanks to our panelists and to our questioners.